I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is Rules and Open Government Committee meeting for June 12th, 2013. Any items on the agenda that we ought to change before we move in? I've got a request to drop item G14 on the overnight big rig parking matters from District 4. Is there a request so we can drop that? And then... So we, we're going to drop item 16, the non-commercial photography fee of that because council dealt with that yesterday. We don't need to talk about it today. <coughs> Any other changes to the agenda? All right, let's just go through it then. Since we only have one agenda today for June 18th, anything? By weight, it's two. It's <laughs> got a few items on it, that's for sure. Anything on page one? We have nine o'clock start, closed session. Uh, looking at the agenda, it looks to me like we could have a closed session that runs longer than the usual amount of time. I think so. Uh, start at nine? Yeah, we we're starting at nine. Start at nine. Friday, 30. Yeah. Right here, eight. have a quorum. Yeah. Yeah. Barely have one at nine. So, yeah, I think we should start at nine, but uh, if we don't get done with that agenda, we'll have to come back in the afternoon and finish it up. But that's of course, if we notice it at 8.30, we could get started at night. <laughs> yeah. 8.30 or as <laughs> soon as we have a uh, The other thing uh, is it's certainly possible that we could go later than 12. We usually stop right at 12, right? <laughs> I think. Maybe possible we can go 12.15 or even 12.30. We'll just have to see how the yep. rest of the agenda looks, but I think we're just alerting council members, and we won't know for sure how long it's going to last until, until we know. Because some of these things uh, don't get decided <laughs> yeah, until yeah, yeah. very late, especially some of our uh, labor negotiation <laughs> items. Okay, anything else on page one? Page two or three? Page four or five? Page six or Seven. Page eight or nine. Page ten or eleven. Page 12 or 13, we have a couple of items that need the uh, sunshine waiver on the 14-day rules. Mm -hmm. Item 2.35, that's a Bird Avenue Sanitary Storm Sewer Project, and 2.39, TIMC Facility Improvement Project. So those <laughs> need to be waivered away. 14-day uh, waiver, they were early distribution items. They were released with the regular packet on Friday. So we got the 10 days? Yes. Okay. Anything else on those two pages, 12, 13? 14 and 15. Uh, item 3.3, the various budget actions needs a 14-day waiver since we just took actions yesterday, and these are implementing those actions. Anything else on 14 or 15? Page 16 and 17, item 3.5. Again, we just took actions yesterday on, on budget matters, and these are implementing ordinances. We need a oh, sunshine waiver. Mayor, is there any reason uh, 3.6 can't go on consent calendar? 3.6, the uh, Agreement of Consulting Services it, Related Labor Relations. It's over a million dollars. That's typically it. the aggregate gets up. So anything over a million typically is not to go on consent, but if the Rules Committee wants to put it on, Okay, I didn't know if we had rules. That's fine. Anything else on page 16 or 17? Page 18 or 19? So how about 313? We could put that on consent. 313 is actions related to fleet management services. And probably four, no, never mind, 4.2 is over. 3.13 can go to consent. 
If I might, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee, uh, or city attorney's um, a rule of thumb is absolutely accurate as it happens given the weight of this agenda. We have moved a few things, I think, that are over a million onto consent. So at the pleasure of the committee. Three point six to consent. Three point thirteen to consent. Yeah, I, I would do that, and then also uh, three or four point two. It's actions related to arena and naming rights. Do we know if anybody from the arena management will be present? I haven't heard specifically, but I'm sure that having it as part of the consent, they're scheduling. Mayor? Yes. A um, little bit late here. At 3 7, I just wanted to point out to the committee we will have a supplemental memo given this is a topic that continues to evolve as we uh, meet and confer with our bargaining units. The hiring incentive referral pilot program for city employees 3.12. Is that probably a consent counter? Yep. It's it is a former program. We're just resurrecting it. So I unless know. you want to make a presentation, I think it's. I don't, I don't think we need a presentation. It's pretty straightforward. Consent as well. No. Anything else on page eighteen or nineteen? Page twenty or twenty-one. We need a neighborhoods commission pilot item five point one. One, there's a uh, sunshine waiver because the staff report is out, but it wasn't 10 days, is that it? That's correct. It was released this week as opposed to on Friday. Right. I think it came out Monday. Yes. So we need a 10-day waiver to get that on. Anything else on page 20 or 21? It's page 22, 23. There's no presentation on 6.1. I think that could be consent as well. 6.1 is the uh, air incentive program revisions. That's the restart of that. Yeah, I think that should just go on a consent calendar. Anything else on page 22 or 23? Yeah, about page 24 or 25, 9.1. The reimbursement agreement with successor agency is a you know, waiver of the 14 day. And it was released on Friday. It's already released, so it would be meets the 10 day rule. All right, that was the afternoon agenda. Into the evening agenda, not many hearings, but a few. Anything on page 26 or 27? It looks like all of these are going to go. I see there are no deferrals on any of them recommended so we think they'll move since this is the last chance to move before August. Anything on page 29 which is the uh, Joint City Council Duradon Development Authority Successor Agency. Did we leave anybody out? Uh, <laughs> joint <laughs> meeting <laughs> and transfer of properties. I have some Requests for addition. To, I think we got all the waivers. I had a list of waivers. I think we got all this as well. A presentation of a check of $10,000 from Youth Connections Foundation add to the ceremonial proclamation of National Dump the Pump Day. Again, a ceremonial item for the evening. Both of those are for the evening. Uh, presentation of accommodations to the winners of the 2013 Falcon naming contest. Mayor and council excuse absence requests, vice mayor and win for rules due to family emergency. Uh, Councilmember Campos travel to Chicago. Councilmember Campos travel to Monterey. Councilmember Herrera's travel, travel to Sacramento. And Councilmember Herrera's travel to uh, Sacramento. Plus, the, the only note I would make is just to make sure there's no surprises for people. We talked about this last week. The mayor and council travel fund is is extinct right now yes. or, or depleted, I guess is the proper word, just to make sure that they know um, that because of that it has to come out of office funds 
in case anyone has an issue with that, they may want to change yep. words. Some of these um, costs will be in the next fiscal year. Okay. So we'll have the, the new travel funds. But okay. yeah, if we're out of funds, it automatically rolls to the, their district. Okay, and then um, I know we talk about this a lot, but they keep coming. We don't need travel approval for League of California Cities or National League of Cities because that's the ones that are pre-approved that we do every year. If there's money. Yeah. It's just, right. just if there's money. Yeah, right. Okay. And we don't need pre-approval for travel in the state. That's correct. Right. As, as well. If there's money. If there's money. It's all about. Uh, some additional ads. FEMA Emergency Management Agency Assistance of Firefighters Grant Program. San Jose Environmental Innovation Center Project uh, Resolution on construction contracts, uh, changes to retiree health care and four-tier insurance premium rates for a whole bunch, eight of our bargaining units. Uh, any chance of having more bargaining units uh, join the uh, parade? <laughs> yes, Mr. Mayor, members of the committee. Uh, two things on this item. One is we, we, we are requesting a sunshine waiver. Uh, this memo went out uh, yesterday, uh, but it normally would have gone out 14 days in advance. So that's one request we have. The, uh, you'll notice that there are eight bargaining units listed. Uh, the one that is not listed is the Association of Legal Professionals because we had not been able to reach a tentative agreement. However, shortly before uh, this meeting, we received word from the Association of Legal Professionals that they are considering the proposed tentative agreement. We presented it to them this morning. They simply needed until tomorrow to have a membership meeting. So what we would ask uh, for this committee's consideration is that we could add them to the list of the bargaining units uh, provided that they signed the tentative agreement tomorrow and they were able to issue a supplemental memorandum uh, tomorrow. And, and the appropriate central waiver for, for that item as well. Okay, I think that's a Ready good news. A motion attempt. Uh, let me see if I got through all of the ads. Yes, those are all the written requests for additions. Any other requests for additions? So okay, I'll try a motion. I would make a motion to approve the agenda as amended with the 14-day sunshine waivers that we discussed on, I believe, four different items. And authority, or also approval to add, if applicable, to item 3.X on the add list, ALP, if the tentative agreement is reached before the amended agenda goes out. Second. Motion is to approve with the amendments. The waivers and the ads. I have a request to speak, Mr. Wall. Sir, good afternoon. Uh, item 2.10. Our good friends at Pat and Bob's. Uh, Thirty-six thousand dollars from July to September. You folks are out in July. Basically, you're still waking up in August. Uh, I think this is a giveaway. Um, 2.16. $179,410 dollars for Don Edwards for water conservation, pollution prevention, and other issues. How many people actually go out there to justify this expenditure? And I know this expenditure is coming from different restricted use funds, and it's probably, you know, they can make the decision, but how many people actually go out there to justify this expenditure? 2.22, 550,000 for vagrant and cabinet cleanups. Why don't we make the vagrants, with the exception of the mentally ill people, clean up uh, their own mess? Item 3.4 and 3.9 could be uh, combined and also put on the consent calendar because no one else is going to understand this stuff but me, and I'm not going to be here next week. Now, the sewer service and use charge, the storm service, we're going to talk about that later today on the public record. 3.12, the hiring incentive uh, referral program uh, goes to issue with uh, Council Member Roach's continuing memos assaulting our honorable city manager's dutiful efforts to maintain effective staffing. Uh, 6.1 should be renamed All Lip on Airways San Jose to Pay to Fly to San Jose program. And item 11.5, rezoning for condos over um, near Santana Row, that place is already a nightmare for traffic. I mean, it's the icon for nightmare over there on Stevens Creek and those freeway exits. No matter how much money you put into uh, redoing those freeway on ramps and, on, on -ramps and off ramps, Traffic is still going to be backed up down 880 until probably the 101 interchange. So I wouldn't have any more residential places there. Uh, thank you. Oh, also, the amount of items on this, sir, 
Uh, thank you. I'll talk for Your later. time is up. That concludes public testimony. We have a motion to approve the uh, changes as we've discussed with the ads, the waivers, et cetera, moving things to consent calendar. On that motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And then opposed, that's approved. No meeting on June 25th. Nothing uh, to talk about for upcoming study session agendas. Legislative update, state or federal, Betsy has nothing to report. M meeting schedules, we have nothing to take up. Public record, anything the committee would like to discuss on the public record? We have a request to speak, Mr. Wall. Sir, first of all, affordable housing, we know they don't pay property taxes, but also, if they don't pay property taxes, do they also not have to pay sewer service and use charge and the storm sewer charges as well? Now, item D, I have a neighbor, same floor plan house as myself. They have six adults and six children living in a two bedroom house. How is it that my wife and I, same square footage, it doesn't really matter. It's, uh, it's depending on your sewage flow to the collection system. How, do, how does this neighbor pay the exact same sewer service and use charge as my wife and I pay, two people versus 12, uh, with reference to Prop 218 and just common decency as far as government charging for services, uh, there's a very big problem there and also how these rates are, are calculated. Now, they're basically based on um, estimates. Now, Proposition 218 has been very uh, generous with sewer charges, but sir, when it comes down to it, when you have 12 people living in a neighborhood in the same, paying the same rate as two people, or even one person, for example, another neighbor uh, only has one person in his single family home, it raises the issue, do single family homes have unlimited sewage discharge with reference to what they're paying? Now, we also look at the different housing products listed on the agenda and their rates that are being paid, and single family homes are almost paying double than any other housing product on the market for sewage. Now, so you take one person, put them in a condo, or one person in an 11,000 square foot home, they're both creating the same sewage flow. Unless, of course, it's designed by statute and by how you raise your rates that single family homes have an implied unlimited sewage fleet. Time is up. That concludes your comments on the public record. Motion to Second. You have a motion to open file. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed? That's approved. Boards, commissions, and committees, we have uh, nominations to various boards and commissions to consider. City clerk's been working long and hard to get us to this point, and we have the new system in place. And I'd like to give the clerk just a minute to talk about any issues that she's seen in terms of this nominating process that's gotten us here, or things seem to be, from my point of view, seem to be doing okay. It's definitely a... a work in progress. I think that there are amend changes uh, in how we do this that we need to look at in the future. Um, we need to give more time to council districts. So we're, we're working on backing up our timeline. So if something expires in December, we're actually going to start notifying council members in September. So there's a, a, bigger, um, a bigger time period for them to respond. So I think that was the hard part was it was very tight. And then like one council district has requested that the Council Appointment Advisory Commission um, nominate for that district. So this would also give them a, more time to, to interview to get people. So I think um, all things considered, it went pretty well. Uh, my staff worked very hard, um, a lot of hours, worked very closely with every council district and we were there to answer all questions. So I, I think it actually went pretty good considering it's our first time and we don't have a written policy of exactly how to do it yet, but we have a draft now that we've went through one process. Okay, <laughs> so we have the boards and commission uh, nominations memo and then we have a supplemental memo with one change. Yes, um, we needed to get the, the item posted, so we were still waiting on one district, um, but they, they got their nomination in, in time to add to the packet but we just had to do it as a separate. So if we got to this point and didn't have all these slots filled, the process would be for us 
we could just go ahead and nominate from here if we had yes. names, or we could kick it to the, uh, the another committee to yeah, select the, some people. Just leave it open and let them go through a yes. process. Um, like uh, if you notice, it's the Library Commission District Eight. They actually requested the Council Appointment Advisory Commission to nominate their library commissioner. So we're convening them for that, but if there were other vacancies, we would convene them to go through the applications. And they're, they're actually going to interview those people who weren't selected to give them a ranking. So if somebody leaves um, or decides this isn't what I want to do or they don't show up and we have to, to take somebody off, we'll have a pool of candidates that have been reviewed that we can then give to the council members for nomination. Okay, well, I want to thank the uh, clerk and the clerk's office for doing a lot of work uh, to get all this together. I have some people who want to speak on this. Might as well take that at this point. Martha O'Connell. There you go. I think it's, okay. it takes a while for it to sound. I know what I say isn't going to make any difference, but I'm still going to say it. I rise in opposition to each and every appointment that was conducted without an interview. Approximately 60 days ago, I met with, with the city clerk, and she has confirmed that we did indeed have this conversation. And she assured me that there were going to be interviews. And those interviews were going to be substantive. And nobody was going to be appointed to pad their resume or to use it for to their political advantage. I went out and recruited two highly qualified women. They didn't even get an interview, and yet appointments were made. That's just plain wrong. I'm also very concerned about one application that uh, included political affiliation on it. I don't think that should be allowed, because that gives a council person who, who belongs to this political party a chance to see that this person was campaigning for a particular governor and even got an award for doing so. I think that's wrong, because it doesn't give the other folks who may not agree with that, that that man should have been elected. The council person is gonna say, gee, that person agrees with me, I'm gonna appoint them. So I think political affiliation should be off the forms entirely. I'm very disappointed, not even more disappointed, I'll be following up with a letter, because now I hear that the people that didn't get appointed are gonna get an interview to stand in line in case somebody who got an, got an appointment without an interview leaves. All I'm asking for is a level playing field. Everybody should get an interview. This is a travesty. David Wall. Sir, this is a reference to the Mobile Home Advisory Commission. I'm at a quandary how they could say anything they've done is an accomplishment. Actually, why don't I have you wait on that because we're going to take up their, uh, their, work, their accomplishments item later. Okay, certainly. Unless you have comments on the oh, no, sir, nominees. I'll, I'll okay, pass. I'll have you hold then. Anything else from the staff? We need a motion. Motion approved. Second. Uh, motion is to approve the nominations reflected in the memos and the supplemental memo. Yeah, uh, comments? I'll Commissioner just Constant? make a brief comment that uh, that either me or my staff spoke to everybody um, that's been appointed and others that weren't um, in making our decision. All right, we have a motion to approve the nominations on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Not opposed. That's approved. We have nothing in our work plans. Annual reports. We have the Mobile Home Advisory Commission 1213 Accomplishments Report. Are we going to have a slideshow? Or is no. No. Okay. I have two requests to speak on this item. Mr. Wall? Continuing, being baffled that they could call anything they've done as accomplishment, I don't know how they can nickel and dime people by raising fees on rent control. Um, that's item number, I guess it's not listed as a number, but number two on attachment A. Now, now, sir, there's been, since we do have rent control, especially on mobile homes, the rent control hasn't been reformulated because there's pass-through charges such as garbage rates, sewer service and use charge, storm sewer, sewer charges. Those are a form of rent control as well because these are, are fees that are coming in and that are passed through by the property owner to the mobile home residents. And that sh those fees should be calculated under the guidelines of a reformulated rent control. 
In addition, uh, we've seen unscrupulous landlords uh, showing up in the Mercury News, jacking up uh, space rents, and yet there's no teeth to the rent control ordinance. So we need to find some way to have measurable deterrence to preclude these unscrupulous landlords by, by really some punishing hurting fees or, or fines placed upon them for their nefarious conduct. A lot of people here, are, they're aged, uh, they're infirm, they're disabled, they don't have the ability to come down here, and nor should they have to. If we have rent control established on the books and you champion affordable housing, these pay, people pay property taxes, and even that property tax is passed through uh, to the uh, mobile home people. So that is also to be included in the reformulation. So when you look at this for accomplishments, I guess it's a matter of perspective, but I've seen too many mobile home issues coming before the Rules Committee and none of them have been positive. Thank you. Martha O'Connell. I'm in opposition to David's proposal. The rent control ordinance should not be opened up because once it's opened up, the park owners can sue. It's already been found constitutional. We don't need another trip to the Supreme Court. But I'd like to address the, the mobile home rhino rights and referrals fee. For those of you who are not aware, once a year, everyone who lives in a mobile home park pays a fee, and the, the park owner pays the same fee. And this money goes to the rental rights and referrals program to do things like hold the, the hearings for rent control, which we had two last year and we've got one now, and they cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So what happened, if you note on the paper, it says unable to reach consensus. That's because the landlords vote no consistently. They vote no on raising any of the fees because they want to drain the city dry so there's no money for the rental rights and referrals program. So the, the neutrals and the folks in the park, interestingly enough, they vote yes. I'm for raising the fee, even though I'm going to have to pay it, because it's the only way to keep the, the program in the black. Right now, even with the, the small increase, that program is still in the red. So I encourage you, when this comes before you and you're voting, uh, raise it up another dollar, because otherwise that program is still running in the red. Thank you. That concludes the public testimony on this. Any questions or comments from the committee? Motion to approve. Second. Motion is to approve the accomplishments report. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oppose? Not opposed. That's approved. Moving to the next category, G, Rules Committee Reviews. We have about a half a dozen <coughs> items on for ceremonial or special events to make them officially sponsored. Consider those as all a four. Consider them as a group. I think there's five. 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 Motion to all five. Amended motion. Second. Okay. A motion to approve all five. I have no cards to speak on any of these items on that motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Not opposed. Those are approved. Legislation. So we'd like to get in front of the council next week. We have three bills to consider. We'll consider them all at one time. AB 16, 616, Boca Negra, local, employee, local public employee organizations dispute fact-finding panel. AB 537, Bonta, Myers, Millish, Brown Act impasse procedures. AB 466, by Quirk, Federal Transportation Funds. I have some requests to speak. Mr. Wall. There's a uh, reference to G7 and G8. I'm only concerned about the perspective of how people interpret an impasse. Now, I know the city from the administration side has been very honorable from their perspective in presenting the case for Measure B and the cuts to city employees and retirees. But it reminds me about the story of Prometheus being stuck on that rock, having a vulture coming down and eating out his liver all night long, just or eating it during the day, and then he heals up all night long. And the same issue is true, is what's an impasse? Having your liver eaten out as a city employee, but yet having to be forced into arbitration to discuss an impasse, where the impasse was a unilateral decision to breach employment contracts. And so 
I think that there should be some discussion in there. I applaud the administration for, for going forward with trying to streamline the bargaining process. But when we start out from an interpretation standpoint that basically has city employees and retirees having their livers eaten out and then systematically given back during the nighttime just to have it re-eaten out again, no, I think there's something wrong with that. And I think that uh, when you have Measure B and its effects as, as the unilateral breaching of employee contracts, you really have an impasse by definition from the start. But I applaud the administration for trying to remedy this unfortunate defect in how uh, people deal with contracts within the city of San Jose. Thank you. That concludes public testimony. We have three bills. The recommendations are as stated from the staff, and we do get them on the city council agenda for Tuesday if the committee wants to do that. Approved. Motion is to approve the recommendations, put them on the agenda consent calendar items as well. On that motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? None opposed. Those are approved. Taking us to item G10, workforce management. We have a memorandum that came to us from Councilmember Rocha regarding workforce management. Councilmember Rocha is here. I assume he wants to speak to his memo. Thank you, Mayor. As far as me speaking to the memo, I think that uh, I read the city manager's one page um, info memo responding to this and um, I did have a few questions unless the city manager wanted to talk a little bit more about um, I guess the discussion we had in the budget meeting regarding the workforce management issue and how that might play into this. Is there any relationship between the two? I don't think there's a relationship between the two. I'm prepared, Mayor, uh, to address the issues if Council Member Rocha wants to reframe them and then I'm happy to uh, respond. Why don't you go ahead and uh, respond. I'll probably answer questions and if Council Member has any additional questions, you can ask them then. Is that right? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be before you today. A as I read the memo, um, there are a few things that I'd like to comment on. And uh, those three things are the city manager's approach to recruiting um, executive positions, what I would call our efforts to refresh our workforce management strategies, which uh, are some of the points that I raised during the, the budget process. And then the, uh, what I read in, in council members' uh, memo, uh, his request for this committee to schedule a discussion of uh, these issues for uh, an August Council discussion and to provide direction and approval. So I'll take each of these one at a time. First of all, uh, on the area of uh, recruitments, let me just say that uh, I think probably one of the most important jobs of a city manager is to hire good people. And so I uh, take this responsibility very, very seriously. National recruitments are widely used as an approach for making hiring decisions. However, they're not the only approach. And so I think that considerations should be case by case in terms of what the uh, best approach is for right, finding the right people. As my um, uh, memo indicated, I have used national recruitments in nine of the 13 department head searches that I have run since I've been city manager. And in the case of the remaining four, I weighed considerations that I believed in my professional view were very, very important uh, given the case-by-case -case considerations. And I really want to spend a little bit of time on the, the thinking um, that I've gone through over the course of my career uh, as I've been confronted with these decisions. So one consideration is how have acting department heads performed? Um, in particular during the difficult times that we're still working through. How long have they been doing the job? And what does this experience <coughs> indicate that we can expect in the future? Another set of considerations are uh, where are the related impacts or what I would say pressures um, in the management structure? How vulnerable is the stability of the management structure or the organization 
at the time that the decision to recruit or not or to bring forward or not is made. For example, will the mere likelihood of a process cause good people uh, to become candidates elsewhere? Or could um, another effect be demotions because typically when there's an acting department head, there's an acting assistant and there's a trail of actings. And so could um, the uh, effect of demotions drive good people out? Another cluster is how important and valuable is the institutional knowledge that has been developed, in particular, again, during these challenging times? How much value would promoting from within be to motivating good employees to stay with the city versus seeking promotions outside? What is the city willing to pay? And also, what is happening in our environment are there complexities that exist now and in the foreseeable future that could be a factor in the recruitment? And one of those complexities, whether it's good times or bad in our environment, in our city, is uh, the cost of living in the Bay Area. But I think we have complexities beyond that in particular now. And then just in general, uh, we've all heard uh, about public sector demographics um, and basically workforce demographics. And, and the public sector in particular, we are experiencing hiring challenges. I've heard it from recruiters. We experienced it uh, with uh, some of our national recruitments uh, in general where experienced executives are retiring with fewer people waiting in line to replace them. So these are just some of the considerations uh, that I think about in deciding uh, recruitment or not. But again, the track record, uh, at least over the time I've been manager, indicates that in the supermajority of cases, um, I have uh, used a search. It is the charter responsibility of the manager to hire the department head subject to council confirmation. And so I do believe that the methods that I've used have been well thought out and have re resulted in the city hiring excellent department heads, again, in particular during these difficult times. Our process is extremely thorough and goes to great lengths to identify the success factors for the department head position by engaging in a wide variety of stakeholders to, to discuss those su success factors and actually to develop them from their perspectives. As you know, I reach out to employees, to clients, to labor, uh, council one-on-ones. And um, the totality of what uh, everyone is looking for is factored in, is compiled into uh, the processes that we use, the assessments that we draw upon, and the selection tools uh, to ensure that uh, there is good alignment between the candidates and what the city needs, and ultimately the person that we select. And then finally, let me just say that once on board, ensuring the success of the new department head is an ongoing responsibility of the manager and the city manager's office uh, regardless of their tenure or how experienced they are. So those are my comments on recruitment, so then I'll come back to my recommendation. Um, the next area I would like to touch on, uh, I think is a very exciting one, and I would uh, like uh, the staff to put the slide up. I know they're, they're ready to queue it up. And this is um, what I would call our efforts to refresh our workforce management strategies, and so for the viewers, um, there is a, a graphic I'd like to touch on. I'd like to give the committee uh, members uh, a copy, Council Member Rocha, and then if we have extras, uh, the uh, okay. others around the table. So needless to say, the city has been through an extremely tumultuous time um, that has been extremely difficult on our workforce and disruptive to our service delivery systems. The budget reductions that have been made have negatively impacted every facet of city operations. Uh, in particular, what I would call the services, uh, that is the programs, the expertise, the support that are critical to our success as an employer. And a lot of those services are internal within strategic support. Being an excellent employer requires a multidimensional system, and that is this ecosystem uh, on the graphic that is comprised of components that all require attention. And I'm not going to go into great detail, but uh, why this is important to me 
um, to, to share with you is because I'm initiating a pilot effort that I want to talk about in a moment um, to begin to do a scan uh, among uh, some case study departments of this ecosystem to assess where we're at. Now let me just say as a professional, um, this, the concept of this ecosystem is not new. Um, it is uh, prevalent in, in the uh, HR field, it's prevalent in city management, um, but it has languished uh, in attention in our city for quite some time. So uh, a well-functioning workforce ecosystem is absolutely critical to sustaining a highly motivated, committed, qualified, and capable workforce. And so given what we've been through, um, Understanding the status of our ecosystem at this point in time is a type, top priority of mine. And as we hopefully move past our major reductions and collectively begin to look forward, I really do think now is the opportune time to engage in re-examining our workforce management strategies, those that are intentional and unintentional, and to ensure that they are moving us forward as an organization. Um, some of the elements of this ecosystem that we'll touch on in our scan, uh, uh, some are, they're all here um, as we engage in this evaluation. Uh, I can predict that we will hear issues about succession planning and the inability to retain and to recruit. Uh, it is not a focus of this scan to get into compensation, but I guarantee you we're going to hear about it. Uh, performance management, uh, how we bring people into this organization, uh, that is onboarding. How do you motivate people to stay here? I think training and career planning, uh, having a place for people to go is very, very important, as well as our total brand as an employer. San Jose has always been a very attractive city, I believe. I'm a, I'm a fan uh, that we still are. But what is it about our brand uh, that we should be uh, refreshing and thinking about in a more deliberate way given we must acknowledge uh, it is a little tougher to recruit right now perhaps in some job classes. And so I think paying attention to our brand is important. So this um, uh, pilot effort uh, with the, ex the uh, ex uh, excuse me, with the assistance of an experienced consultant in the field of human resources is how I want to proceed. This will result in a scan, a rapid assessment of our ecosystem using four pilot departments. I haven't talked to those departments yet, uh, so if they're listening, they're going to hear about themselves. Um, I've invited them to a, a meeting with me next week. Uh, I believe they're all excited, but it will be the airport, uh, planning, building, and code enforcement, environmental services, and uh, one more, Ed. Transportation, thank you. Um, and there are a variety of reasons uh, for those departments, uh, but they do represent a very good cross-section of some of the issues that we are experiencing and actually having to address on a one-off basis. Uh, this will give me an understanding of the strengths, gaps, and the strategies that should be prioritized for action. At that point, I will have something to discuss with council. Um, this discussion will likely occur in the fall. I'm thinking the October time frame. The proposal from the consultant paces us through uh, September and we have to be realistic about those processes and reports and so forth. So I'd like to emphasize that uh, this effort is a refresh uh, of what we know is important but has had to languish. Reinvestment in the city's workforce planning and support system will be a multi-year effort. This means it will take time and money, and the prioritization, at least initially, will come from this pilot. The pilot will lead to more guidance and decisions about additional targeted study, if necessary. I think that we can study this sort of thing forever, and I'd want to make uh, progress along the way. It will also guide resource allocation for human resource functions, whether they be central or decentral, and areas of emphasis in the short term and the uh, mid and long term. So in conclusion, I do not recommend a council discussion in August for direction and approval of these two issues. Regarding executive searches, the city manager should have the discretion 
to use the approach that makes the most sense given the many considerations that have been expressed. And my track record shows that recruitments have been used in the supermajority of cases to reach a hiring decision. The workforce development uh, planning and support uh, process that I've described and issues are a, a top priority for me. As I expressed publicly when I raised my interest during the budget hearings and Council Member Rocha asked me to explain what I was thinking, I expressed the concept behind uh, this pilot. Actually, it was already under discussion with the consultant and um, I was giving it a lot of thought. And I did say at that time that I needed the space to assess our needs before bringing the council into the conversation. And why is this? Um, it is not to be professionally uh, obstinate or arrogant. It is because we really don't know what we don't know at this point in time. And I am uh, concerned that too large of a discussion or effort at the front end could slow us down from taking important and urgent steps. And so again, I'd like the space to um, have the conversations with the teams uh, who would be part of the pilot. Um, this effort will see the conversations that follow by giving the council and city management information to serve as a basis for action. The council's interest and engagement at this time will be extremely important um, to do what we all need to do in moving forward. So those are my thoughts, Mayor and uh, committee, and I'm happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Okay, well thank you. As, as usual, you're, you're well ahead of us in, in thinking through some of these issues that are much more complicated uh, than sometimes uh, are noticed by me anyway. I can't speak for everybody else, but uh, Councilor Rocha, did you want to no. say anything or have any questions? In terms of responding to the presentation just provided by the city manager, just, I want to start by saying thank you for this presentation and for the information. Um, the discussion that I heard at the budget hearing was, uh, as you've already alluded to, um, you thinking ahead of time, and I'm very excited about that. I've been raising the issue about workforce management for a little bit now, and you've been making it pretty clear that you're, you're well aware of that issue. I understand that things don't happen overnight, um, whether it's uh, a government agency or a private agency. This, time, this kind of investment and work takes time. Um, I am completely supportive of the approach that the city manager is taking based on what I've heard. I might even encourage us to even defer this because you spoke about a couple items that caught my attention, which was um, investment of resources and staff we might want to consider this at mid-year budget, which I think is in February, because that might tie into some potential actions that you might want to recommend. So I, if anything, I'd rather provide the amount of time that the city manager needs rather than encourage anything accelerated. So that's not my interest here. It's just I was selecting a time that I thought might be appropriate as we moved into the new fall year uh, of the budget year. But I think based upon what I've heard, uh, if the city manager is comfortable, I think that time might be best appropriate. Okay, city manager. Yes, I think that's, you know, reasonable and, you know, as we as we get information from the pilot, I think we'll have a better sense for the best way to pace, but I appreciate that uh, acknowledgement, council member, and uh, I think we all want what's right for the city and for this workforce. Okay. Well, I would, I would suggest that we put a, uh, not too specific, but an October-ish uh, placeholder uh, for you to present, you know, whatever you get out of the pilot with maybe your, it's even just a progress report yeah if you have recommendations or a progress report if you're not ready to make recommendations to get it back to us yeah, and so it back to rules and then we can get on the council agenda somewhere in that time frame but I agree with Councilman Rocha that if there are specific things you want to do we might be able to take them up uh, at mid-year budget uh, because we know that uh, the resources you've had available to the workforce uh, things have been have been cut uh, quite a bit and so if we get it in the fall, that would be timely, I think. If, Councilor Rocha. If I may ask a follow-up question, in the, I don't know what role the Human Resources Director would play in this, but is there any update that you could provide here publicly on that and so sure. I can better understand the relationship between the two? Yes, ultimately I think this um, pilot effort will surface issues that will help a Human Resources Director hit the ground running. But I don't want to wait for the Director. We have an open, continuous process underway as uh, resumes are coming in, we're not waiting for panels or committees or any of that. We're screening as, as we go. Um, so in the meantime, uh, I'm going to be heading up this effort with uh, a small team, which will include 
um, Ed and, and, and Alex and, and uh, members of his team, as well as the department heads and the four pilot uh, departments, uh, Kim Wallish as our chief, chief strategist, and Jeff Ruster is going to be uh, project managing this. And so as we um, you know, gain our information, um, I think it will dovetail very nicely and be a wonderful handoff to our new director once we have one. Okay, Councilor Constant. I just wanted to reiterate my comments from previously that I think that uh, the approach here um, with the memo from Council Member Rocha um, was the wrong approach to take. I think the charter is really clear on where the responsibilities lie. And um, in my experience here, we have ample opportunity to discuss with the city manager department head appointments and process, uh, both in our one-on-ones, the formal um, inquiry she makes prior to starting a search, the questions that we have an ability to have input to that are presented to the candidates, the closed session interviews and confirmation process. And um, I think it's important that we, while this, I think it's great that the city manager is informing us of her work in this workforce um, ecosystem review, uh, I think it is really something that should have been brought up if there is a expectation that she wasn't doing things properly during her performance review, which we just completed. Um, I believe that the city council has a role of evaluating the city manager, and I know that's something that you point out in your memo, that it is part of your efforts of um, overseeing the management or, or the activities of the city manager, and that's the appropriate uh, time and place to do that versus airing this um, publicly, especially when a memo goes out that has uh, what I believe is inaccurate information on the method of selections. And I think you can clearly see the difference when you look at the city manager's memo that shows the national recruitments. And we all knew about those because we were involved in the discussions with her. And um, we have council appointees for a reason. We have charter section 411 for a reason. And we have the appointee evaluation process for a reason. And I think that's where these discussions should have belonged. And I don't believe we should be having them in this forum. So I'm looking at section 1071, city manager powers and duties. City manager shall make such other reports as the council from time to time may request concerning the operations of city departments. Nowhere in section 701 or section 411 does it state only during city manager evaluation. There's another sentence in here. However, the council may express its views and fully and freely discuss with the city manager anything pertaining to the appointment and removal of such officers and employees. So I recognize that and I did my work ahead of time um, and I have provided feedback during the city manager's evaluation um, based upon some recent actions and direction that was taken by the city manager, some department heads, I felt uh, at least an individual council, I have the authority to make this request. Well, I think it's inappropriate. And um, you know, like I said, when we do the evaluations, that's when we talk with our appointees and we tell them what we expect and we evaluate their performance and, um, you know, in being fully engaged during the entire evaluation and showing respect of our appointees is what should be expected of us. Appreciate your individual opinion. Thank you. Anything else from the uh, committee? So, okay, so we'll expect a report back in some form either with recommendations or status report probably October yes. uh, with the work that you're doing and hope, you know, seems to me you're moving in the right direction. There's work that needs to be done. Thank Anything else? Speakers. Okay. I have some speakers on this. Take those now. Martha O'Connell. I wasn't planning on speaking on this, but I think this was a, a thoughtful memo. Um, I note that there's nine members of the public here to listen to uh, the city manager's report, and I think it's entirely appropriate that it be uh, in a council meeting. I don't know if it should be August or October or whatever, to have more people understand what's going on and to have all the council members there to give their input and ask questions. So that's all I have to say. David Wall. Sir. The complexities of public sector demographics. The nexus of this is Measure B and its ongoing 
dramatic attacks on the organization that has posed the problem between council member Rocha, the rules committee, and the city manager. City manager cannot, because of the ramifications of unilateral contract, breaching of unilateral contracts, people of means don't want to come to San Jose if you can any time arbitrarily and unilaterally break employment contracts. Now, the financial state of the city was such that action had to be taken, but that's beside the point. The city manager has responded through item 3.12, the employee referral program that's on the uh, June 18th agenda. Council member Rocha is right in his reading of the city charter that he can ask these questions, even though it may be inappropriate at the rules committee. He, it, that's not in the charter. Now, the main part of the charter that's not discussed is 411.1. Now that is where council member Roach's memo is on point because the appointment of deputy directors escapes most of your attentions, but yet they outlive you election cycle wise and can be very deleterious to the organization. And I'll mention the environmental services department, the, uh, the assistant director position, one of the most incompetent uh, positions there is not to mention the, the director of that entity. Sir, if I was appointed director of ESD a year or two ago, you would have two or three brand new engines for power. You do not have that. The whole fiscal year is gone. But Council Member Rocha, focus on 411.1 because that, as it applies to election cycles, has very dramatic and deleterious effects if Your we time is up. have our honorable city manager. That concludes the public comments. I'd just like to uh, close with saying uh, I look forward to seeing the report on the workforce uh, management. I think that's useful, but it's, it's, I don't believe it's our uh, purview to tell the city manager whether or not to do recruitments. I think she's explained how she does it. Excellent explanation. Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. It's really her call. Ultimately, the council uh, weighs in on the confirmation process with an up or down vote, and that's just the way the charter lays it out. Uh, so I think... Uh, investing in the workforce management is a, a good thing to do. And so we'll look forward to getting that back to the council in October. Anything else on this? No, thank you. Okay. I appreciate the support on this effort. All right. Thank you, Councilman Rocha. Thank you. October, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong section here. Items uh, 11 and 12, which are uh, Referrals to the Elections Commission and recommendations back from the El Elections Commission. We talked about these briefly last week, and I wanted to bring it back so we could talk about how we sequence it when we get a hearing. And I, I think we can get this to the council in August, but I'd like to have it move with my recommendations on my biennial ethics review, which means I have to get that done and get it out so that they can move together in August and exactly what meeting that might be. I think when we went through the dates last time, uh, we have time in August and multiple dates where yeah, we could yeah, get, it, get, get it approved, get it changed, get it fixed, get it noticed, get it you know, on and on and on to be effective by December 1st. Yeah. I, I usually work backwards <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and usually 45 days from the, uh, for a first reading from the date, to the extent you need an ordinance, from the date of uh, when you want it effective. So if de December 1st is the date you'd want it the first reading no later than mid-October and earlier the better. Okay. So there were a couple of substantive things that I wanted to talk about uh, today. A couple of the items from the uh, commission that I think we might want to discuss and, and figure out how to deal with. So one of those is item number seven, the confidentiality of investigations. Uh, the commission is uh, recommending no change with regard to breaking confidentiality when a complaint's been released to the press by the complainant or respondent but wants to look at amending a complaint form to address some of those issues. Uh, if they want to recommend changes to the complaint form, I think that's okay, but uh, I prefer to give the commission some power so that un under the right circumstances, the commission, using its discretion, can decide whether or not uh, you know, a complaint was filed as a political statement, filed as a sham, and they shouldn't be bound by the confidentiality provisions wh which were there, uh, put in there for a reason uh, not to require the commission to act, but to at least give them the power to do something. And right now they don't really have a lot of choice 
uh, in the matter that they have to pretend that it's confidential when everybody in the world knows uh, what's going on. So I don't know what else we might give them in terms of discretionary authority, but they ought to have some ability uh, to deal with this, uh, a situation. And, and, and we can work with the commission on that. And I don't know what was uh, discussed at the commission on this issue, but one thing that comes to mind is is the commission having the ability to give weight or, or weigh the validity of the complaint, or uh, the, if if it is leaked to the press, if it is seen then as a political statement. I mean, those are the types of things that you could put in criteria. Um, but I think that's something that the commission may have already discussed, or they may have other ideas, but it's something we can look at. Well, I, I know they've discussed it, mm -hmm. but uh, the, way, the way, that, way they came out, I don't think, yeah. is, is good enough yeah. solution to the problem. Yeah, it, it went back and forth. The, the main issue being, um, do you want to make a judgment call? Okay, if, if, say, I file a complaint against uh, Council Member Doe, um, and I release it to the press, that's one thing, but how do we know that that person, how do we know the complaint it released to the press? Did somebody else get wind of it? It was, it, it just kind of went back on, if the person who actually made the complaint didn't want it to be public, but somehow somebody else made it public, they were afraid of confirming it when, it, it just, it kind of got into, how do they know that it was actually released by the person that they think released it. Well, when we hold a press conference on That's the city true. The courthouse steps or the city right. hall steps, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. And at, at what point do we just confirm, yes, we received the complaint? Um, are we able to make comments when, when, so far everything's been very neutral. So the investigator is the one who, who actually investigates it. And then the elections commission looks at that independent evaluation. Um, I think they're uncomfortable with with being able to just say, oh, we think this is a political one when they don't know for sure unless it's been fully investigated. Um, the Being able to just confirm, yes, we received this complaint, um, we felt was, and I say we, but the Elections Commission felt, well, if we confirm it, then are we then giving weight to it? If we confirm, yes, we received this complaint against Councilmember Doe, that's all we're gonna say, does that make it now look like a valid complaint? So it was that, that concern that they don't want to give weight to a complaint that may be for political purposes, um, where I mean, keeping that, that neutrality that they have with having the independent investigator actually do the evaluation before they make comment. So does that, am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely, you're making very good sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would like to have for the council, and the council considers this as some policy alternatives okay. on it that they may or may not have discussed and probably did, because I think they probably thought about it long and hard. But there are circumstances in which the, the commission is obviously being used for political right. purposes. And I don't think the commission should have to sit there and take it without being able to say anything about it. And what those circumstances are, I, you know, I can't predict. Uh, because all of the things you mentioned could be things uh, that might happen, but I don't, I want people who think they're gonna come down and file a complaint, hold a press conference, generate a news story, and that's all they care about, to at least know the commission, in, in hands are not tied, with being able to say, you know, the, whatever that needs to be said, I don't know what that might be, it depends on the circumstances. But, you know, we've had instances where the commission has been used, and, the best way to, to kill a commission is to allow it to be used for political purposes. The county used to have a commission, and it got used for political purposes, so they got rid of it. Milpitas used to have a, a process. They got used for political purposes, and they had to get rid of it. I think ours works pretty good, and I want to maintain that, right. to have a disincentive to use it for political purposes. And I'm not sure what that is, but this is an area where I don't want the commission's hands uh, to be tied, and okay. so I'd like to see some policy alternatives w when it comes to the council so we can uh, sort it out. Okay. Uh, the second area of interest is the gift ordinance. There's a, a draft ordinance that the uh, city attorney's office has been, been working on, uh, which essentially is to take all of the words out of our ordinance and replace them with reference to the Fair Political Practices uh, Act, which I think is okay, except now I don't know what the rules are. And so when you present this, none of us are going to know what the rules are. You're going to have to have an explanation of here's what's changed in this provision and here's how you can find the rules 
So you're going to have to get the regulations or whatever it is that is the guiding body to us in some fashion uh, because we're not going to have our own ordinance to really to look at. And we would do that. I mean, I, I thought of attaching the regs with this, but if you take a look at state law, which I know you have, it's a lot more, uh, a lot broader than what uh, what we have now. So that's something. The I, the whole idea is um, behind this, and this has been a concern. Is sometimes we say a gift is X, and the FPPC says a gift is Y. And if you're a council member, it's like, okay, is it a, is it a gift under city or state? And we're trying to make it as consistent as possible. We'll still have some differences, uh, the $50 limit, but um, uh, we would we would bring that in. And a lot of it, if we can do summaries, uh, bullets of what is, what isn't. I mean, the, uh, the FAQs, whatever we can do to educate, I think is the best way. But um, that's a good note. Well, I hesitate to put specific regulation references in an ordinance because they're constantly changing. So the generic, this is replaced by the Fair Political Practice Act or something. Well, that's true, except there is a regulation somewhere that has this information, but you can't put it in the ordinance, so that's going to make it difficult for uh, us and our staff to work through it. So I would think maybe on this one, uh, when we get done with it, we'll have an ordinance, and then maybe you'll need to publish an annotated ordinance that's not an ordinance, it's just a questions and answer kind of a thing. It says, in this area, here's what the state provides. And keep updating it from time to time as it gets amended. As, so. it, as it does get amended, because I know you guys get a lot of calls on gifts, because there's a great deal of confusion. Everybody wants to be cautious. Uh, so I don't want to make it harder, uh, but I do recognize the importance of trying to be consistent with the state, so that's less difficult. I did have one substantive question, because I couldn't tell you know, what the intent was with the change, and that has to do with uh, gifts that uh, were intended to be for the city. I forgot what section it was, I'm bringing my draft uh, ordinance with me. So I would say at least once a week I get a gift. It's at a delegation of ASEAN foreign ministers in my office this morning. They gave me a gift. It's not for me, but I don't want to have to cross-examine them and say, is that a gift for me? Is that a gift for the city? Because I don't keep the gifts. I don't really want the gifts, but it's a cultural thing to give gifts. And so I take them, I hand them off to my staff. But I don't have anything in writing from them that says it was a gift to the city and not a gift to me. And uh, it looks like the language, that, the revised language is going to make it a lot harder for me to distinguish that. And I'm going to have to go ask these people, would you please tell me whether that was intended for me or the city? If it's intended for me, I can't accept it. Uh, thank you very much. So, and that it, it, the intent is to clarify it so that when it is a gift from the Dublin Sister City Committee or a gift, gift from a prime minister or someone intended for the city, it is for the city, and it's not. You don't have to worry. Yeah, about but we don't know what their intent is. <laughs> well, it, it, and if I you seem to do it, you, they come into the council meeting, they give me a gift in the front of everybody. We don't ask them what their intent is. We have to infer that intent. In the draft language, I think, doesn't allow you to infer the intent. You need to get a, a specific statement from them, and I think that's culturally well, that's difficult. difficult. That's difficult. We've had that issue before with some, as you mentioned. So uh, What I want is, that's look, well noted. somebody hands me a gift, yeah. I give it to the city staff, it belongs to the city, take it to the warehouse with all the, I'm sorry, we put them <laughs> in the display case with all the other gifts that we've gotten. Uh, it's not for me. I don't take the gift, <laughs> and I don't need to know what their intention was. If I want to keep the gift, there's a provision in there that I can get council approval for the gift. I've right. never used if it, that. If it's, if it's dinner, it's easy. If it's, you know, right. a, a picture or a portrait or something. And God only knows what these yeah. things are worth. <laughs> yeah. A so couple of them I've looked at and I thought, man, that's a really expensive gift. But I don't really know for sure. I don't need to know because it's not for me. It's for the city. This is why the state has pages and pages of regulations. So right. But I don't want to make it harder for us to figure that out. No. It's been well taken, and I think okay. that's this is something that's been historically a problem, and it comes up frequently, particularly a mayor, because the mayor is the one who gets usually the one who, who meets with heads of state and officials and gets those those gifts. You know, I, I really enjoyed getting a an iPad, an iPhone, uh, a computer, you know, all kinds of stuff people give me. I send them down to IT. I don't know. I don't know what happens to them. I, IT takes them. It's not for me. It's certainly worth more than fifty bucks. Uh, but I, I take them and treat them as gifts to the city. And I, I just want to make sure that's a simple, straightforward for everybody uh, way to deal with it. Pete. 
Well, thanks. I experienced similar when I went to Korea and going through the memo process and getting it all sort of which were consumed gifts, which ones went to the city, which ones were de minimis, uh, was quite a hassle. And then I still have some sitting in my office because I don't know where they go, even though they're city gifts. And you also have the thing when people come and visit you, they expect to see the gifts that they gave the city. So sometimes you have to be able to find figure them. out where you send them and how you get them back. It's just something we just have a corner in our office that has them stacked and figure at some point when I move out, I'll just hand them over to somebody. But it'd be nice to have something so you know exactly where they go. Uh, on a couple other items, uh, on the first item, which is number 11 in the memo, referral number one on the expenditure limits and campaign contributions. Um, you know, I've, uh, the situation that we have where independent committees can outspend the candidate, which we've seen as recently as the District 8 Council election, and they also aren't necessarily bound by the time, the 180 days or whatever it is, the, the contribution period. Um, there's got to be some way that we need to look at dealing with that. And I know that a candidate has the ability to um, not accept the voluntary expenditure limits, but then they get the scarlet letter on the ballot statement, which um, my understanding is there's been rulings we can't even, we're legally not even supposed to do that. The scarlet letter has been said that uh, courts have ruled that you can't have a scarlet letter for um, not participating in a voluntary process. So I'd like to get some information on that to see what the status of the law is on that. I've heard it from a couple of different people, but I don't know exactly what the law is. Um, but I think we need to do that because you see, like I say, in the District 8 election, we saw where it was such a lopsided spending. And what we're doing, quite frankly, because of our uh, contribution and expenditure limits, we are pushing money outside of the campaign to other sources where you have n absolutely no control over not only what's said, but who's saying it and how they're saying it. And um, I would much rather see us address that and whether it's 24-hour reporting or instant online reporting, whatever the case may be, do whatever we need to do to keep the money in the campaigns and make the candidates responsible for who they take money from and how they spend it versus allowing um, outside groups to spend three times as much money. Um, so hopefully we can continue to have that conversation. And then uh, going to the issue that you first started talking about, the complaints and the confidentiality, can we require that when people file a complaint that they sign a confidentiality agreement? We, we, the, I don't know what was discussed at the committee or the commission with respect to amending the form. The, it's clear that the, at the time of filing it says it's to remain confidential and the only people that are supposed to get access or have access to this are the chair of the commission, the city clerk, the city attorney, and the uh, investigator, uh, and possibly the district attorney if, if necessary. Um, but as we know, people have spread this around town and it becomes the, the next day's headline. Uh, no, people knowingly do this, we can probably add a form that says it, this is in confidential. Uh, the question is how do you enforce that if it, if it is released? So it all comes down to enforcement more than anything else. We have prohibitions on uh, releasing this and, and not keeping it confidential. If the question is, is what teeth do you have to enforce right. that? I don't know that we have a penalty associated with it, a direct penalty, and I think that's where we should be looking, because if someone has a press conference, you obviously have evidence that they released it publicly. Um, and we know that in certain cases, um, complaints were door-to-door -door passed around neighborhoods um, to uh, create uproar. It's those egregious areas where I think we need to have some teeth that we can do something. Yeah. I don't know what the law allows us to do, but that's well, what I'd like to you, see. You us. could probably have something, again, it comes down to proof and 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 penalties or enforcement. And and if, if you're going to then put the commission in a position where they have, they have a hearing or somebody would have a hearing and due process that did you or did you not release this to the Mercury News, 
um, that becomes a separate process in and of itself. So, I mean, those are all, I understand the concerns and significance. You know, one thing we never did was criminalize any of this. I mean, this is all by design to be civil only. Um, if you were to give, and whether the district attorney would even entertain uh, investigating breaches of uh, confidentiality or, or, or disclosure of materials that shouldn't be disclosed, it raises a whole set of other issues. So I think it's something that's probably best taken back, you know, with staff and perhaps the commission and have a f further conversation on ideas. Okay, get my, my final comment on that is somebody who um, turns something in and it says it's confidential, but it doesn't say you're breaking the law if you break confidentiality versus someone who signs, I understand it's confidential, versus someone who signs, they understand it's confidential and the penalty for violating it is X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, those type of things have an effect on behavior. And, and I think the, at least if you get someone thinking twice about what could happen, and we all know DNA can uh, change an investigation fairly quickly, people might think more about doing these things that are, um, as the mayor said, politicizing complaints and using it for advantage and, and not playing fair by the rules. Any other comments from the committee? I have a couple of requests to speak. David Wall. <laughs> Sir, one thing the commission didn't look at, and I don't know why, let's say you take a sitting council member or a sitting elected person or a combination of sitting elected persons and one of their friends, their cohorts, is running for office. They want that person to, to get elected because as a group, they vote for whatever policies they want. So they form either an individual financial corporation or a conglomerate of contributors and act like a financial institution to either transfer, gift, or uh, charge for loaning money to a campaign. Now, with reference to District 8, we saw a unique, very legal application of a variation of what I've just discussed, where an elected person acted as a quasi-financial institution to loan, transfer, or gift monies to a person running in District 8. Now, this person prevailed. And that's what prompted me to say, well, this is interesting thing that an elected person can become a financial institution or a holding company to fund uh, a friend's election purposes, whether they get paid back or not. Now, with reference to item one, last week I misread the 75 signatures, which was not uh, to increase the burden upon people running for office, but uh, to make it, to facilitate them getting the required signatures. What I was not wrong is why do we need 50 signatures for our city council position when only 20 are needed for the county? Item five should carry some very significant punishments if you're out there paying for people to sign your nomination people. And I would like to thank personally the election commission's uh, work. They've done a really good job on the items they've listed and I'm very grateful to them. I also as a comment. Your time is up. Uh, either uh, comments or questions from the committee, I guess we need uh, direction to staff to uh, keep working on this and get prepared to put something in front of the city council in August. Now, your, your intent is not to draft an ordinance until it's been to the council? Well, we have this draft gift ordinance change. Uh, right. we, can, we can play with that, but in terms of the campaign ordinances, uh, we want to get council direction first. Before, okay. And I don't know if you want us to come back to the rules with anything before we go back to council. Yes, I, I would like to come back to rules with it so we can make sure it's coordinated with the okay. Mudbang Ethics Review and we'll s set that up. So, okay. we'll be back to uh, here, the first Rules Committee yeah. meeting in August. Would yeah, be August 7th. Okay. So, I'll make a motion that we refer this to the clerk and the attorney to return to us in the first Rules Committee meeting of August. Second. Okay. I have a motion to bring this back August 7th with the schedule to get it on the council agenda in and August. Is that just for item 12 or that was 11 and 12 both. both. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's some difference that we didn't pick up. All right. On the motion, all in favor? Right. Opposed? None opposed. That's approved. Next item is the retired communication policy, a recommendation to put it on the council agenda. Second. 
Motion is to approve. Would that be consent calendar? Yes. Yes, it would be on the motion. I have one request to speak. Mr. Wall. As a retiree from the city, um, it's interesting. I don't like to see this on the consent calendar. There's a lot of retirees, uh, especially the old timers in the police fire department and other city employees for that matter, that are dramatically affected by what you do with reducing uh, benefits that were agreed to during the time period before they were hired, during the time period they were hired, and as they s slipped into retirement, all those agreements were enforced. Now, you're coming after the retirees, myself included, uh, with these draconian measures, and um, I think that that's inappropriate for retirees, especially those uh, such as Councilmember Constant, who was wounded, of the medical retirees, such as myself. Our benefits, uh, especially health benefits, shouldn't be cut if we're, you're wounded in service. But that's something that needs to be addressed in a more uh, open measure versus uh, slam bam, thank you ma'am, on the consent calendar. I think you owe some form of respect to the employees who are in the retired services from their retired uh, aspects instead of just mealy mouth and okay, why don't you have an affirmative duty to die and dig your own grave in the process? So I want you to think about this and don't put out a consent, but have it out there so the public can, because the public is the one that's gonna suffer with the continuing loss of services and the quality of services because of how you treat your current employees as reference to how you treat your, your retirees. Thank you. That includes public testimony on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Oppose? None opposed? That goes on the 18th agenda. Next item is also for the 18th agenda. That's my recommendation motion to, to modify the general salary for city manager, city attorney. We have a motion to approve the recommendation putting on the council agenda on the 18th consent calendar, I presume? Yep. yep. Consent calendar. Mr. Wall? Sir, if you look over to your right, you see our dutiful city attorney. And you look over to the left and you see our dutiful city manager, but you're not looking so, because I know why. You're too ashamed to only give them 2% for the good work that they do. Now, sir, don't you think we should reformulate their, their increases to the amount of money that they save? Because both entities save the city millions of dollars and they should get, you know, a thank you in the form of a tax-free bonus or increased wages because they do really good jobs to, because of what they have to work with. And that's you folks. Because you cause them all sorts of grief to try to run a professional organization. And, and you don't mean to do it, you just do it. And so I think 2%, now let's go back in time where our learned and honorable independent police auditor was heralded with merit increases other pay increases that far exceeded 2%, 4%, 6%. For what? Helping illegal Mexican gangbangers prey on good police officers in our police department? No. But let's look once again to your left and your right, Mr. Mayor. A cursory glance to folks that are saving this city, and you're just going to give them a 2% raise, thrown on the consent calendar with no more than a how do you I, I, it's all that I can take. This should actually be a rules bonus for having to put up with it rules as well. But I mean, that's just my <laughs> Thank you. That's called hazard pay. We have a motion to put this on the council agenda for the 18th on the motion. All in Aye. favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? That's approved. Next item is the Rules and Open Government Committee work plan and schedule. Motion approved. Second. Motion is to approve. Mr. Wall? Sir, this gets to what's happening on the 18th. It happens every time the council gets ready to take a vacation. You have tons of items on the consent calendar. Now you should really make either an amendment to the charter to where this does not happen. Because, it may, because you've given yourself extra vacation days uh, because of you know, how they fall on holiday time periods. And so your work plan, I mean, why don't you put it on your work plan not to allow more than 10 items on a consent calendar. I mean, could you only give two minutes for any citizen uh, to speak on the entire consent calendar? Well, I can speak on all of it because I know all this stuff, but I'm precluded. Now, that's another issue for another day, but the main underlying issue is you're not doing your jobs as a council 
to end the year up with tens of millions of dollars on the consent calendar because you frittered your time away with extra vacation days and just basically not getting the job done. And that gets to the issue of your work plan. You know, find out how many issues you have to do per month and get them done. I think that's fair, especially uh, when you consider you can appoint people to a salary setting commission and then have the noble effort of saying, no, we're not going to take our raise. But, sir, I, I think you should really focus on this because this consent calendar is out of control at the end of these uh, council years. Thank you. That includes public testimony. We have a motion to approve the schedule and the work plan on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Unopposed? That's approved. Open forum is our last item. Martha O'Connell. Day for open forum. It's very disrespectful when people come down here. Uh, I'm requesting that the city do something about those doors, either install a, uh, a button that you can push to get in or put a big sign there telling us, I, 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 I can't push the door today because I've thrown my back out. So I had to ask this kind gentleman to open it for me. And apparently there's, if you go around the corner, there's a button but I didn't know that because there's no sign, and I also understand that sometimes the corridor is shut, so um, we wouldn't have access to the button. And also, um, I'm not sure if there's a way to get out of this room because I don't see any buttons on the doors, so I just respectfully request that you consider doing something about the situation. Mr. Wall? One, a couple items I'd like you to consider uh, when you're rebuilding the organization is one, annuity-based hiring. In other words, start thinking every employee should be hired, and at the minute they're hired, second, they're on an annuity. The annuity is structured to include their salary, retirement, cost of living increases, merit in step increases, and what have you. That will start moving the city away, especially if you do it the public sector or the uh, public safety people first, because police and fire, we need a, they don't need to be bothered when they're dodging bullets about whether or not they're going to have their jobs. For the overall city employees, think of uh, setting up another uh, economic instrument to benefit them of revenue sharing to make them whole, to start rebuilding the city's reputation of a good place to work with, with reference to not unilaterally breaching contracts because of financial stresses on the organization. Earlier today, on another matter, I viewed from my front window, sitting at my desk, a person trespassing entering the property of my neighbor, vandalizing his roses, cutting them, so stealing his roses as well. I called 311 uh, for police to come out because my neighbor's been victimized by this all the time, the people stealing his uh, apricots and what have you. I was uh, basically given a ration from the 311 dispatcher, which I understand, okay, because they don't probably hear calls like this. But what's a citizen to do to stop trespassery entering of a property without permission, vandalizing the city pro or the personal property of another, and then stealing that property? Now, citizens have ways of, you know, if, if it's forced to where citizens have to take the law in their hands, of course, you, you make the citizens arrest and you can use reasonable force. But when you see open theft and then the public rebuke of that Sorry, theft. Sorry, your time is up. Jim Piazzo. In 1980, <laughs> government passed a, a law saying basically that you guys <laughs> can't, there's a pre-closure and a post-closure. Now, what is this dump going to be, a pre-closure or a post-closure? Because if it's a post-closure, you know and I know, Mr. Rickdahl, you have to have the money in the account already to close this cap, to, to close the dump. Where is that count, uh, the account for uh, zero waste? And by the way, I read the zero waste uh, lease. They can do anything uh, they want on it. They can pollute as much as they want, and then the taxpayer has to pick it up? Are you kidding me? Who wrote this contract? Charlie? Hello, I'm Noble Mayor, Council Members. I just want to share my story. Uh, recently, 
I've been looking for a place to live, and I went online, Google a few places, and uh, you know, same old thing, and then I found this one place, really great deal. I was like, wow, and it sounded too good to be true. So I went online and looked at the reviews, and they had horrible reviews, and I, you know, I was like, wow, disappointing. But uh, I also found out it was an affordable housing thing. I was like, oh. So I went and I Googled all the other affordable housing units, and you'd be surprised to see what you get. Uh, anyways, there are some good ones. And so when I decided to apply, I was like, okay, let's check it out. And I applied for it. And it said you have to make minimum of twenty to $40,000 a year. And I'm like, a maximum of 40. And I'm like, I don't qualify. Not because I make too much money, but because I don't make enough money. And then I thought about it. What person who makes twenty, forty thousand dollars a year more than me needs to have affordable housing? And we, and we talk about it's going to be helping homeless people. What homeless man do you know makes twenty to forty thousand dollars a year? Why would they be homeless if they made that much money? So these affordable housing units who are supposedly supposedly helping the poor, um, they, they can't be helping the poor. They have to be helping people who are richer than me. Thank you. That concludes the open forum. Concludes our meeting. Wait, We're not don't quite adjourn. adjourn. City clerk has a couple of things. Uh, we need to cancel next week's meeting, so I need you to adjourn to August seventh. Okay, the schedule was just approved. The next meeting would be August seventh, so we need a motion to cancel next week's meeting. Motion to approve. Second. Motion Sorry. is to cancel next week's meeting. On the motion, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Sure you don't None opposed. <laughs> I'll be here next week. I'll be here. But we're canceling the uh, rules committee meeting. There's still work to be done. So that concludes our meeting. We can adjourn. Yes, we can. All right, we're adjourned. <laughs>